With the return of J.D. Martinez imminent, what will the Mets do with the red-hot D.J. Stewart? I'll discuss that and more on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you uh, amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and it loves me some Monopoly Go the mobile hit twist on the classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now, free on the App Store or Google Play. We're going to talk a lot about the Mets roster throughout the show today, particularly with the return or, I guess, the debut of J.D. Martinez imminent now. The Mets expecting him to be with the big league club on Friday. Who will be the roster casualty? And what do they do with D.J. Stewart's playing time? He's been one of the Mets' best hitters this year. So a lot of that to discuss. But first... We got a game to talk about here, and the Mets lost their second game in a row. It's the first time we can say that in about three weeks, the last time being when they started the season 0-5, and and since they have not lost a consecutive game, I'm pretty sure it's pretty much been each end of a lot of those series that they have, have ultimately won, but long story short, they just did not have a great game on Monday night. We can go through all the instances. I just feel like it was one of those games where you sort of knew the luck wasn't on the Mets side. And it started early, top of the first. Brandon Nimmo leads things off, lining out to the shortstop. Um, you know, if he hits it anywhere else on the field, that might be a hit with how hard he hit the baseball. But he lines out to Nick Ahmed. And then Starling Marte lays down a bunt, which was a base hit, but he tries to advance foolishly to second on an errant throw and is thrown out by a mile. So you just look at that first inning. If – Nimmo's hit ends up, or if Nimmo's line drive falls for a hit somewhere and Marte gets on with his bun, or even just one of those two things happens where they have a base runner, who knows? Maybe Pete Alonzo homers early. Maybe they make Keaton Wynn work a little bit more. Instead, Wynn has an easy first inning, and he pretty much rolled throughout the game, gave up a home run to Pete Alonzo, but didn't really struggle too much. So you know, the Mets, I talked about it going into this series on yesterday's show, previewing what was going to lie ahead here. And I said, look, if you can get into that Giants bullpen early, you got a good chance to win. They didn't do that. Win pitched into the seventh inning, and they were able to go to guys late in the game that they trust, and they got the job done. But when it comes to what went wrong for the Mets outside of the lineup just not producing, you know, Jose Catana did not have his best start. Um, one inning though, that I think could have had a completely different complexion is the second inning, which is the first two runs that the Giants scored. Jorge Soler hit a ground ball to lead off that inning that Jeff McNeil quite literally booted. I mean, he kick saved. I don't know what he was doing. It was clearly his ball. The last second, I don't know if Lindor called him off or if he just realized that Lindor was going to get there as well. So he was caught in between letting it go and going after it and just literally kicks the baseball. That opens things up for the Giants in that inning because Quintana strikes out the next batter, gives up a base hit to Michael Conforto, walks Tyro Estrada, strikes out Tom Murphy, so nearly gets out of the bases loaded jam, but then gives up a hit to Nick Ahmed. Originally, it looked like a double off the wall, but that was ruled foul. And you thought maybe the Mets still had a little bit of luck on their side and they would get Ahmed out and, and get out of the inning, but instead... Ahmed hits one up the middle that Lindor just couldn't quite get to. He deflects it, but two runs come around to score, and that was the beginning of the end for the Mets in this one. They had their chances, uh, but ultimately the Giants just put up five on Quintana, and the Mets couldn't come back from it. Uh, Matt Chapman drove in two with a double in the third inning. Quintana got through the fourth and the fifth pretty um, unscathed, and then in the sixth inning, Carlos Mendoza lets Quintana try to get Michael Conforto out left on left. And first pitch, hanging curveball right down the middle. Conforto did not miss it. And there you go. The Giants had a 5-1 to one lead. With all of that said, while it wasn't a great game for the Mets, and they obviously have now lost two in a row, I will say there were still some encouraging signs for this series. What I mean by that 
is the Mets at least for one protected their own bullpen. Jorge Lopez pitched after uh, Quintana. Sean Reed Foley, who was just added to the roster, as was Josh Walker. They each pitched an inning, and they all pitched well. So they kept the game close. And then with the Mets only trailing 5-1, to one, Bob Melvin needing a win for his team to start off the series right, he goes to his closer, Camilo Duvall, to try to get a quick ninth inning, hold on to a lead and get a win. And the Mets really made him work, 27 pitches. Uh, they got the tying run up to the plate in DJ Stewart. They didn't ultimately do enough with it. They only score one. But that is a, a moment where it can really trickle down. And now Camilo Duvall might only be available for one more game this series. And so maybe there's a situation over the next couple of days where the Mets are facing somebody else in the ninth inning and they can steal one. Uh, th- that was a really good sign for this team. And also note, just on Sean Reed Foley and Josh Walker, the roster moves the Mets made there. They optioned Grant Hartwig. So we can kind of look at that as a swap there of Hartwig for Walker. And then Sean Reed Foley takes the spot of Michael Tonkin, who was DFA'd yet again. Now, interesting little tidbit about that. The Mets now have an open spot in their 40-man roster. Now, that spot could remain vacant. They can make a claim on somebody. Uh, They can add somebody to the roster, like, I don't know, Christian Scott to be a starting pitcher that could help their rotation coming up here. Or they can wait, and when Kodai Sanger or David Peterson needs to be activated off the 6th of the IL, that could be their their spot waiting in the wings for him. I think that decision today was more about just clearing the active roster spots than thinking about the 40. But it, it did make me ponder it, knowing that, hey, the Mets don't have to clear a spot in the 40 for Christian Scott that decide to get a better option in that rotation over Adrian Hauser if they want to go to a six-man rotation. Now, as far as the Giants and what lies ahead in this series, Logan Webb is looming in game two, so that's going to be a really tough task for the Mets. At least they faced the three really effective relievers that they have in this first game, Ryan Walker, Tyler Rogers, Camilo Duvall. Taylor Rogers has been good this year as well, but he's more of a lefty specialist. Those are brothers, Taylor and Tyler. Uh, But... When you look at uh, the next couple games here, hopefully with those guys a little bit worn down, the Mets can get Logan Webb out of there early if possible. Um, you know, just don't let him stay in there through seven, right? You get him out, you get into the underbelly of the Giants' bullpen in a close game. The Mets, I think, can steal one late, particularly if Luis Severino can hold up and put together a great start on Tuesday and then the final game of the series. Uh, you have uh, Blake Snell going up against Sean Mania, So that'll be a fun one. Uh, I, I do wonder, though, a completely different note. J.D. Martinez had the chance to play with the San Francisco Giants this year. He didn't want to hit in that ballpark. Is it a coincidence that maybe the last series he doesn't play in before coming up to the Mets is in San Francisco? We'll talk about the imminent return of J.D. Martinez in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. And particularly, if you want to go to some Mets games right now, this is the place you want to go. You want to see J.D. Martinez make his Mets debut on Friday? Head over to the Game Time app. I'm going to look it up right now here and see what tickets are looking like. For Friday night's game, Mets, Cardinals, of course, 7-10 first pitch. You can get in the ballpark for as low as $3. I'm seeing a seat that's you know down the third baseline. It sits in the, the upper section there, but $5 a ticket. You can look even further down. They have certain tickets that are spotlighted with the you know best deals available where you can get a seat that's section 122, row 7, that's down the third baseline, close, $74 a ticket. You see the view of your seat before your eyes, so you know exactly what to expect, and all in prices up front, so there's no hidden fees. Game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. So if you want to go to a Mets game this year, head over to Game Time, down the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked on MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms do apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code Locked on MLB for $20 off. Download Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Today's episode is also brought to you by Policy Genius. 
You never know what can happen in life. That's why you got to make sure you're prepared to have your family taken care of. This is why everyone should have life insurance. But sometimes finding the right policy, it's not easy. It can be really time consuming and just overwhelming. This is where Policy Genius comes in. Policy Genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace that will save you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net. With Policy Genius, you can find insurance policies that start at just $292 per year for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer same day approval and avoid unnecessary medical exams. With Policy Genius, you can compare quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find the lowest price and their team of licensed experts is there on hand to help you through it with no incentive to recommend one insurer over another so you can trust their guidance. Check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with Policy Genius at policygenius.com slash locked on MLB or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes. See how much you could save. That's policygenius.com slash locked on MLB. Right now, if you look at the OPS leader on the New York Mets, it is not Pete Alonso. It's certainly not Francisco Lindor or Brandon Nemo. No, the OPS leader on the Mets is DJ Stewart. He has an 892 OPS. He's drawn 10 walks in 38 at bats, three home runs, two doubles. So he has a 500 slugging percentage, 392 on base percentage to get to that 892 OPS. He's only hitting 211, but he is a three true outcome hitter. Walk, home run, strikeout. Those are the options for DJ Stewart, but he's doing it very well. His chase rate of 13.3%, the lowest in baseball. His 21.3% walk rate, the highest in baseball. That's pretty impressive when it comes to the plates discipline and the selection of, of pitches that Stewart chooses to swing at. He's only swinging at the best possible pitches. Doesn't always get the best results as evidenced by that 211 batting average, but when he is connecting with the baseball, his barrel rate of 21.7% is in the 99th percentile in Major League Baseball. His hard hit percentage of 52.2% is in the 91st percentile. You also have expected WOBA, which is the expected weighted on base average. It's formulated using exit velocities, launch angle, and on certain types of bat and balls, sprint speed. So that's, of course, balls that are hit in the infield, whether the sprint speed will get you there for a hit. That gives you the expected weighted on base average. So it is, in some ways, an expected batting average where every ball is given a single, double, triple, and home run probability based on the results of comparable batted balls since StatCast has implemented all of that information directly from MLB.com. But what you got there when it comes to expected weighted on base average is a way to measure how effective a hitter is. You know, if a hitter has a 350 expected WOBA, they're a pretty solid hitter. If they have anything above that and anything nearing 400, that is a, a great mark. And for DJ Stewart, his expected WOBA is 395. Now, his weighted on base average is 427. So his results have been slightly better than expected, but still very, very solid because he's eliminating a lot of the issues, right? He's not chasing. So he's you know getting rid of a lot of pitches that could hurt him when it comes to a stat like this. When he is connected with the baseball, he's squaring it up and hitting it very hard. So that's going to impact the exit velocity. He's launching properly, you know, and, and that is going to increase the expected batting average on a ball when the launch angle is correct. So he's doing all the things that you'd want from a hitter right now from an analytics perspective. He's giving the Mets good at bats. So as much as his role is the one that's going to be most um, you know, taken away from by the insertion of J.D. Martinez into that DH spot that Stewart has been holding down, you can't just option his bat down with how well he's hit. You can't because he's useful to this team. The question is, how do you keep his bat in the lineup? You could say, all right, well, he's an outfielder by trade. Play him in the outfield. Okay, so who's he taking playing time from? doesn't matter how much Nimmo struggles. It's not going to be Brandon Nimmo. And Stoyan Marte has been great this year. You're not going to bench him for DJ Stewart, even if his OPS is a little bit higher. You know, he's not going to bring you the same defense for sure. Not that Marte is an exceptional right fielder, but he's certainly a lot more athletic and better 
than DJ Stewart out there. And he's hitting for a high average, you know, doing a lot for the Mets atop that lineup. So you're not going to bench him. In some ways, you could come to the playing time of Tyrone Taylor or Harrison Bader, but those guys have been producing. Tyrone Taylor has the third best OPS on the Mets at 786. He is leading the team when it comes to batting average at 318. He's tied with DJ Stewart for the fourth most RBIs at 10. So Taylor is playing well, but he's not even the starting center fielder. That's Harrison Bader, who's hitting 294 right now. Now, granted, if we look a little bit deeper into Bader's numbers, you see that of his 20 hits, only one has been a home run, two have been doubles. So his slugging percentage for a guy that's hitting 294, it's pretty low at 368. He's walked twice, he's struck out 16 times. On base percentage is just 324. OPS is 683. Those aren't standout numbers, but again, he's playing a good starting center field out there. He is hitting for a high average. He's come through in some big spots. You could start Stewart and left, bench Bader, and have Nimmo play center field again, but then your defense takes a pretty big hit. All of a sudden, it's Brandon Nimmo in center. That's a step down from Bader. I mean, going from Nimmo and left to Stewart and left, that's a huge step down. And then it's still Marte out there, but uh, that's not as good of a defensive team. Now you can cut into Taylor's playing time, but again, it's the exact same equation. So I would imagine that the role for DJ Stewart is going to be occasional DH and left-handed bat at the bench. And the Mets can play a lot of matchups. And I actually think that there is a world where you're going to have a lot of games where one spot in the lineup is used by all three of Harrison Bader, DJ Stewart, and Tyrone Taylor. And I can explain that by looking at today's game. Eighth inning, Harrison Bader took an at-bat against Tyler Rogers, the submariner, and he looked horrible and had absolutely no chance. In the future, if J.D. Martinez is your DH, in that same spot, DJ Stewart's on the bench, you can go to Stewart in the big spot in the eighth, try to get on base. If he walks, well, Tyron Taylor can come in as a pinch runner and can play defense for you. So there are ways the Mets can use all of these guys, and it's going to be in more limited roles. And you hope that the production can stay there when they aren't getting this much playing time. One of the great things about the J.D. Martinez situation this year is it has allowed guys like DJ Stewart, Harrison Bader, and Tyrone Taylor to flourish. It's allowed them to put Starling Marte at the DH spot, keep him in the lineup every day, and keep him fresh. You're going to lose that with J.D. Martinez. So what you're going to gain is an unbelievable hitter that's going to lengthen your lineup. So this is not to say the Mets are better off without J.D. Martinez. It's just that they will get a lot different when they have J.D. Martinez in the fold. And for D.J. Stewart, it's going to be a big adjustment because he's going to have to make the most of even more of a limited role than he already has. But who would get cut if D.J. Stewart stays? That's the question. It really comes down to two guys. I'll break it all down in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. My favorite game right now is Monopoly Go because it just gets me so competitive and it is so much fun. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded over 150 million times. It's a great twist on the classic Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. And it's not just the classic game where you can charge rent on your iconic properties, but instead now you can also rob vaults. So that's pretty cool. You can rob your friends' vaults of their riches, take them for yourself, or you can play along with friends um, in time tournaments where you can earn huge rewards. You can also find the leaderboards will show you who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is out there. So if you want to get in the game, play with your friends today, join Monopoly Go, or excuse me, download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. So if DJ Stewart is not optioned down when J.D. Martinez is ready to join this team, who will be? There are two guys, Joey Wendell and Zach Short. So far this year, they've combined for 32 plate appearances in 22 games. They're not getting into that much. That's why I think they would be ideal candidates to be optioned, or in this case, DFA with neither having an option, um, off of this roster because they have very similar skill sets. They are defensive first utility infielders. But for me, when I look at these two and who should get cut, there's no question about it. And it's Joey Wendell. That's not just because I've hated the signing of Joey Wendell ever since the Mets gave him $2 million this offseason. 
because I don't understand what's that different from Joey Wendell and Jose Iglesias, who they got on a minor league deal. What changes between those two guys? What forced you to give Wendell a $2 million deal coming off a horrible set of seasons with the Marlins? Why did the Mets do that? that? That's always been a gripe that I've had. But that's not why I think that the Mets should DFA him. It's because I think Zach Short's better in the role that the Mets need. When J.D. Martinez is up, I just alluded to all these different guys trying to get at bats. Is there even going to be a start in the infield for anybody outside of Jeff McNeil, Brett Beatty, Francisco Lindor, and Pete Alonso? Maybe Beatty needs the occasional day. Maybe Jeff McNeil does. But for the most part, McNeil, Lindor, Alonso, they're going to be playing every day. And in the infield, I don't think that McNeil is going to be in the outfield much. So the one spot that you maybe need some help is third base. And Brett Beatty is very you know, much proving to be an everyday player himself, but he's the guy who would get more days off. He's the guy that would sit against a tough lefty. If you're going to sit him against a tough lefty, are you going to play Joey Wendell? Zach Short is a more ideal complement to Brett Beatty a third, but it's not just that. It's the other parts of the role. Who's the better defender? Well, Joey Wendell has inexplicably made three errors in 12 attempts this year. Who's the better backup shortstop for Lindor? Wendell at 33 or Zach Short at 28? Zach Short made this team for a reason. He hit the ball harder than most did throughout spring training. At one point, he was hitting the ball harder than anybody in the Grapefruit League. It's spring training. It doesn't matter that much. But at least there's been some semblance of a hitter who has a ceiling that they can still tap into. Is it a starter in the big leagues? Maybe not. But can he give you quality at bats off the bench? Will he take his walks? Can he lay down a good sacrifice bunt? Is he a good base runner? He checks all of these boxes that you want for a guy that's going to be the last man off your bench. So if it was up to me, I think the move is pretty simple here. When J.D. Martinez is ready to come up on Friday, you DFA Joey Wendell. And that also clears another spot in the 40 because eventually you will have those pitchers coming back. And the thing, too, about DFAing Wendell is I think he'd probably go unclaimed, and he might accept an assignment back to Syracuse anyway. When you look at Zach Short, while he's not some elite player, do I think there's a team that would put a claim in for him? I think Danny Mendick just got back on the White Sox roster. You don't think that they would maybe say, you know what, why not have Zach Short come play for us? Start on that team. So I I really do think that it makes the most sense to – DFA Joey Wendell when J.D. Martinez is ready. And then trying to get playing time for all those guys is going to be tough. I think J.D. would be in a situation early on where he's probably going to play twice in every three-game series. So that would leave a start open for Stewart, maybe two starts depending on the week. And then again, situationally coming in when you need a left-handed bat against a tough righty, comes aboard, hopefully can get a hit, draw a walk, hit a home run. Uh, But There's a role that I see for Stewart, even with J.D. Martinez on the team. I have not understood why they've carried Wendell and Short all year, other than just, you know, it was their best option to get production, and they didn't really want to have Mark Vientos be some guy off the bench that was creating a distraction. And, man, speaking of distracting numbers, man, Vientos and AAA has been unbelievable. But for this Mets team moving forward when they get J.D. Martinez back, I don't think it makes sense to carry both Wendell and Short. If it was me, I would take the guy that's five years younger and looks like the better defender right now, who also complements the one player in the infield who might not play every day in Brett Beatty, having a right-handed bat, not the worst thing in the world. So that's how I think the Mets will ultimately handle it. We'll see if that plays out. It very well could be Short instead of Wendell, which would not surprise me, um, but I think it would be a mistake. Anyway, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked On Mets. We'll have a big ace showdown. That's right. I'm calling Luis Severino an ace going up against Logan Webb on Tuesday night. I will be breaking down everything from that game on tomorrow's show. If you don't want to miss it and you're listening on the audio side, make sure you follow, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. Uh, you can also follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. Thank you for making Locked On Mets your first listen every day. Now for your second listener, your second watch, head over to Locked On Sports today where our local experts from each team are there for you, as well as our league-wide experts from each league. Find Locked On Sports today, streaming 24-7 
on YouTube.